of our life. Good morning. Welcome to this public meeting of the Consumer Product Safety Commission. Can I confirm that all the commissioners are here? Commissioner Biacco? Here. Commissioner Feldman? May need to unmute because. Uh, I'm muted and I'm here. Thank you. Thanks. Commissioner Tromka. I'm here. Good morning. Morning. And Commissioner Boyle. Good morning. I am here. Thank you. But before we start the business day, I would like to recognize and thank my colleague, uh, Dana Biacco, who is here for what will most likely be her final commission meeting. Um, Dana is a wonderful colleague and has been a good friend over the past year. I want to take a moment to express my appreciation for her public service here at the commission and the difference she has made during her time at the commission by bringing experience developed in private practice and a clear pragmatic perspective to product safety issues. And I'd be remiss if I didn't also recognize and commend her chief policy advisor, Dottie Yar, who has been a stellar staffer to Commissioner Biacco. So thank you. Thank you, Alex. I really appreciate that. And you guys all know how emotional I get, so I'm not going to do that and let people record me crying. Um, so let me just say that I'm proud of the work that we've done together um, during my time here, and I'm leaving the commission, I believe, in, in really good hands. So um, I'm only a phone call or a text away, of course, um, but I will I'll definitely miss you guys. Well, thank you. and Good luck. Um, so, this morning, we are here for the staff's briefing on a proposed rule to establish a consumer product safety standard for adult portable uh, bed rails. In March, the commission voted unanimously to move forward with this rulemaking. That vote came in response to two petitions filed on the issue. Gloria Black, who lost her mother in a bed rail related incidents, the consumer voice for quality long term care. Consumer Federation, 60 other organizations submitted the first petition nine years ago. Public Citizen Health Research Group filed a second petition. And I'm pleased we now have a draft notice of proposal rulemaking in front of us, and the process is moving forward. In a moment, we'll turn to this meeting over to staff so they can brief us. Once they have completed the briefing, each commissioner will have 10 minutes to ask questions of the staff as multiple rounds if necessary. Briefing us today uh, is, uh, sorry, just going back in this room. Um, and obviously, if there are any questions with respect to the legal authority or other advice, um, we can have a closed session, uh, executive session. Um, uh, briefing us today, we have Vinit Daya, oh, I'm sorry I butchered your name. Um, Project Manager, Division of Mechanical Engineering Directed for Library Sciences, and Hyun Kim, Attorney, Regulatory Affairs Division, Office of General Counsel. Also joining us are uh, Jason Levine, CPSC Executive Director, Austin Schlick, General Counsel, and Alberta Mills, uh, Commission Secretary. And with that, I'm going to turn the microphone over to our briefers. Good morning and welcome to staff's briefing on the draft notice of proposed rulemaking for adult portable bed rails. As the chair chairman stated, I'm Vinny Dayal, the project manager for APPRs, and I will be briefing the commission alongside Hyun Kim from CPSC's Office of General Counsel. Um, next slide. Walking through the structure of today's briefing, first Hyun will explain the underlining rulemaking process and legal considerations for the NPR. Then I will give a brief overview of the product and the general background leading up to this point. After that, we'll move on right into the re uh, staff review of the hazard analysis, market outreach, and compliance actions. Staff's review of the existing voluntary standard, staff's proposed rule, and economic analysis of that rule, and then one last summary of staff's recommendation to the commission. And with that, I'll hand it off to Hyun to get started on the next slide. Good morning. My name is Hyun Kim. I'll be giving a brief overview of the statutory framework 
for issuing a standard under the Consumer Product Safety Act. This rulemaking falls under Section 7 and 9 of the CPSA. Section 7 of the CPSA authorizes the Commission to issue consumer product safety standards that consists of performance requirements or requirements requiring warnings or instructions. The requirements must be reasonably necessary to prevent or reduce an unreasonable risk of injury associated with the product. Section 7 of the CPSA also specifies that consumer product safety standards must be issued in accordance with the requirements of Section 9 of the statute. Next slide. Section 9 of the CPSA provides procedural and substantive requirements for issuing a, a consumer product safety standard. It specifies that a notice of proposed rulemaking must include the text of the proposed rule, alternatives to the proposed rule, and a preliminary regulatory analysis. Section 9 also requires that the Commission must provide two opportunities for comments. First, Section 9 requires that rulemaking must be in accordance with Section 553 of the Administrative Procedure Act, which requires that agencies give notice of a proposed rule and the opportunity to submit written comments on it. Second, Section 9 requires that the Commission provide an opportunity for interested parties to make oral presentations of data, views, or arguments. The proposed rule provides for an opportunity to provide both written comments, as well as for any interested party to request an opportunity to make an oral presentation to the Commission. Next slide. As I mentioned, an NPR requires a preliminary regulatory analysis. Section 9 provides that the preliminary regulatory analysis must discuss the potential benefits and costs of the rule and alternatives to the proposed rule. Next slide. To issue a final rule, the Commission must consider and make specific findings, and these findings must be included in the rule. At the NPR stage, these findings are preliminary and must be included in the regulatory text. This slide shows some of the required findings, including the need for the public of the rule, and the effect of the rule on the utility, cost, and availability of such products, as well as the means of achieving the rule while minimizing adverse effects on competition or the disruption of manufacturing or commercial practices. Next slide. In addition, the Commission must make preliminary findings on existing voluntary standards. If a voluntary standard that addresses the risk of injury at issue has been adopted and implemented, the Commission must find that either compliance with the voluntary standard is not likely to adequately reduce the risk of injury or that there is not likely to be substantial compliance with it. Next slide. Under the draft proposed rule, APBRs would be required to meet the requirements of the voluntary standard ASTM F185-17 with modifications to address the unreasonable risk of injury associated with entrapments on APBRs. I will now turn it over to Vineed, who will provide further information about the background of the proposed rule and APBRs. Thank you. Next slide. Thanks, Ayun. So, as you can see, this timeline provides a quick background on the events and work that led up to this draft NPR. In 2013, the APPR petition was docketed. Then in order to assist the development of a voluntary standard, the commission voted to defer a decision on the petition. From there, staff worked with ASTM to develop a standard and in 2017, they published F3186. Then staff began reviewing the market collecting market samples for testing, and reviewing the final form of the standard to determine if it would adequately address the known hazards. All of that included two separate rounds of market compliance testing to the voluntary standard. Then, per the information presented in staff's 2022 briefing package, the commission voted to grant the petition and directed staff to develop a draft NPR. 
So with all that history behind us, the next slide will show exactly what an APBR is. Next slide. As you can see in the pictures to the left, APBRs are products that consumers install on the sides of their beds. They are used as a solid support that can help prevent users from falling out of the bed, help them reposition in bed, or get them in and out of their beds. Next slide. Staff's review of the APPR incident data revealed that the majority of incidents were fatal and most victims were over the age of 60. Per the analysis of each incident report, staff found that 85% of all incidents were related to bed rail entrapments, which also accounts for about 92% of all APPR fatalities. Generally speaking, this directly ties into the idea that APPR products are often used by vulnerable populations that have limited mobility. Users that need help getting into and around their beds due to medical conditions or injuries often don't have the capability of self-rescue if they find themselves entrapped. With that in mind, I'd like to notify you all that the next slide includes pictures of actual incidents and may be uncomfortable for some to see. Next slide. So, as mentioned, here are some examples of APBR incident staff reviewed. Although it might take a moment to digest, you can probably see that there are a number of ways and locations rail entrapments can actually occur, and that these incidents are completely dependent on the size, shape, location, assembly, or installation of these products. Next slide. Ultimately, after reviewing all of the incident reports, staff found four major entrapment zones, which include within the product, under the bed rail, between the rail and the mattress, and between the mattress and the end portions of the rail. Next slide. Staff specifically reviewed each fatal entrapment report in order to identify the most likely zone each incident occurred in. The majority of fatal entrapments, entrapment incidents occurred between the rail and the mattress. It should be noted that 70 of these incidents are listed as unknown, and that's because the death reports did not provide enough information detailing the language. But staff still believed if more information was provided, most of these would fall under one of those four major zones. As shown in the column to the furthest to the right, the voluntary standard currently addresses all of the known hazardous entrapment locations with performance requirements. And it aims to address those entrapments related to other zones through requirements for warning, labeling, and instructions. Next slide. So staff's work has not only been internal to CPSC. Beyond the petition work, staff utilized all available venues of approach to address these known hazards. In 2020, the Office of Compliance sent a letter to industry notifying them about the seriousness of entrapment hazards related to their APBR products and urged them to comply with F3186. Staff was also actively involved with ASTM 1570, providing all interested parties updates on the available incident data, presenting staff's compliance testing results, and through several other efforts to promote healthy developments and involvement in the voluntary standards process. Next slide. Staff is also involved with several APBR compliance actions, five of which in APBR product recalls, uh, resulted in APBR product recalls related to 13 deaths and 23 individual models of APBRs. The table provides a general summary of these actions. Next slide. Per CPSA requirements, staff assessed ASTM F3186 in order to determine if the voluntary standard would adequately address risks of injury associated with APBRs. While the standard does have performance requirements that are most closely related to APBR hazards, such as entrapment, structural integrity, retention systems, and misassembly, staff found that the standard would need additional modifications in order to adequately address the known hazards. And furthermore, Staff's compliance testing results showed that there was no market compliance to the voluntary standard. Next slide. For this draft NPR, 
Staff proposed several modifications to ASTM F3186-17 in order to adequately address the known APBR hazards. These modifications include additional definitions for terms used throughout the standard, guidance and test setup requirements for mattress heights, and for products with multiple settings, improved language for several test methods so all interpretations address known hazards, and several corrections to dimensions, tolerances, and other editorial needs. Next slide. The market for APBRs and similar products is expected to grow, meaning that even if these incidents occur at a constant rate per product, CPSC may see a significant increase in the average number of deaths, from 17 deaths per year to an average of 32 per year over the next three decades. Each year, these deaths are equivalent to about $300 million, while the annual cost to comply would be around $2 million. If only entrapment hazards are addressed by the proposed rule, it would result in a net benefit of $265 million per year. That's excluding any residual benefits from additional prevented deaths and injuries likely to be addressed by the rule as well. Next slide. Staff's economic analysis went on to assume that even more conservative scenarios by also accounting for less than ideal regulatory efficacy rates as well. Even assuming that the regulation present, pre prevents only 25% of the 92% of fatalities, the net benefits are still around $65 million annually. That being said, staff did find that the rule would have significant adverse effects on three of the seven identified small manufacturers. But with the expected future growth in the space, it is highly likely that more manufacturers will join the space rather than leave the industry. Next slide. In addition to the proposed rule, staff considered six alternative actions. Staff does not recommend any of these alternatives. The first four listed would not adequately address the known hazard modes, and moving forward is highly likely that the majority of the $300 million in annual societal costs would continue to be felt or even increase in coming years. While st staff doesn't recommend the fifth and sixth alternative actions, staff would like to hear comments within the comment period of the NPR regarding these options. Again, staff doesn't recommend an effective date beyond the minimum 30 days due to the fact that that industry should be adequately aware of these hazards related to APBRs and staff's ongoing actions. Next slide. In summary, to address deaths and injuries, staff recommends that the commission publish an NPR that mandates a safety standard based on ASTM F3186-17 with modifications to address the hazard. And staff also proposes an effective date 30 days following the publication of, of the final role in the federal register. And with that, uh, staff's briefing package on the draft NPR for APBRs has come to an end. And on behalf of myself, Ayun, and the entire team, thank you all very much for your time. Thank you very much, both of you, for the and all the staff that worked on this. Uh, at this point in time, we're going to turn to questions from the commissioners. I'm going to recognize myself for 10 minutes. Um, and again, thank you, Mr. Dial, for your briefing. And apologies again for mispronouncing your name early on. Um, as you said, one of the petitions submitted to the CPSC on this issue called for a ban on portable bed, uh, bed rails. Uh, obviously, the staff is not recommending this and acknowledges that there are going to be unaddressed um, fatalities from the standard. Um, what was the thinking in considering? Can you expand a little bit more on? thinking between considering a ban rather than a performance standard? Yeah, so um, approximately 180,000 APBR units are sold annually, which is indicative of their utility in that people are buying these products. Um, and these are products that consumers rely on to reduce their risk of falling out of bed, assist them repositioning the bed, and assist them in trans transitioning into or out of their beds. Um, if we were to ban APBR products from the market, that could potentially leave consumers without any alternatives. The APR does ask or comment on whether a ban would be appropriate. Is that correct? 
Yes, um, so staff uh, did recommend um, recommend asking for comments on um, banning the product and um, the potential loss utilities associated with that. Thank you. I also notice that the package recommends a 30 day effective wait uh, date based on the fact that uh, firms are well aware of the voluntary standard and should be able to easily meet the standard. Um, even though staff shockingly has found that there's no products that meet the voluntary standard. Uh, can you expand a bit on why the firm staffs uh, firm? Sorry, the staff believes that firms will be able to meet the requirements of the 30 day standard once if the rules are finalized. Yeah, sure thing. Um, so staff assesses that the compliance actions taken to write the letters to the firms in 2020. Um, you know, to note that the non compliance with the voluntary standard um, would be an indication of substantial um, product hazards and related um, and the other related efforts that we've done to recall um, APBRs um, has sufficiently alerted firms to the voluntary standard. Um, and then furthermore, um, we assess that the changes that would be required um, by the draft proposed rule um, would feasibly be completed for a low, low cost. Um, but despite all of that, um, staff is still seeking comments. Um, we recommend seeking comments um, in the NPR um, for those factors. Given this awareness, the uh, commission also consider an anti stockpiling provision uh, at this point. So staff recommended the minimum 30 day effective date. And that's because, again, through staff's um, outreach efforts and compliance actions, the APBR industry is adequately aware of our current um, voluntary standard and um, rulemaking efforts. Um, but again, uh, that's something that we will uh, we would like to see comments on. Thank you. Thank you again to both of you. Uh, those are my questions for now. I'm going to turn to Commissioner Biacco. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you both for your good work on this project um, and your presentation. The question I have really is. Uh, more for the benefit of some of our listeners, as people have asked me this question, and I'm not sure I gave the best explanation, but why um, are these bed rails um, under the jurisdiction of the CPSC and not the FDA? What's what's the difference between these bed rails being a consumer product versus a medical device? Um, I'll address that question. So, um, first of all, the voluntary standard covers both bed rails that are under CPSC's jurisdiction and under FDA's jurisdiction. Uh, FDA first came out with its guidance because they found that hospital beds also had railing that posed similar issues. With respect to the jurisdictional question, of whether it falls into CPSC's jurisdiction versus FDA's jurisdiction, if an APBR has a medical purpose that is classified by the FDA as a medical device, it would fall under FDA's jurisdiction. We note that FDA does not reference bed rails or bed handles. Rather, FDA regulations talk about movable or latchable side rails. So FDA regulates adjustable hospital beds for medical purposes. So bed rails that are an accessory or pertinent to a regulated hospital bed is considered by the FDA to have a medical purpose and be subject to FDA's jurisdiction as a medical device. That's where the rail is integrated into the design of the bed. For CPSC, we look to see how the bed rail is marketed, how it's sold, how it's advertised, and whether it, it serves any medical purpose by the advertising. So that's how we distinguish whether it falls under our jurisdiction or whether it's more appropriately under FDA's jurisdiction. I would also note that FDA representatives have also been part of the ASTM um subcommittee um, uh, meetings so they're well aware of all of these discussions that we've been having about bed rails 
Thank you very much. I do appreciate that. And that that I don't have any more questions otherwise. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner. Uh, Commissioner Feldman. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Dial and, and Ms. Kim, I want to thank you uh, again for the presentation and uh, obviously I'll offer my my thanks uh, to all of the agency staff that, that worked on this. Uh, the adult, adult uh, portable bed rail uh, is, is a product that, that does present a, a real risk of death uh, to one of our most vulnerable uh, populations. Uh, uh, this is an issue as, as your timeline laid out that's been uh, on our radar at CPSC for quite some time now. Uh, this rulemaking was a key priority of the former acting chairman and one unfortunately that he wasn't able to deliver on. Uh, but I'm pleased that we're now at, at a spot uh, where, where we're moving forward. So I, I do want to congratulate you, Mr. Chairman, uh, and this commission in particular for uh, getting to a point where, uh, where others have failed. Uh, it's an important step forward uh, in terms of protecting consumers uh, from APBR entrapments. I support the NPR. I think that this is something that we're going to get done. I think that Americans are going to be safer because of our actions here. I have no questions, uh, but uh, again, appreciate the presentation today. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner. Uh, Commissioner Trumka. Thank you. Uh, so, where we know the hazard pattern, almost all the entrapment deaths in our data are in zones two, three, or four. So, in other words, where someone died because they were wedged between the mattress and the bed rail, as opposed to being entrapped inside the bars of the bed rail itself. So, so where the mattress is a factor. Uh, now, the proposed performance standard measures mattress. It takes into co uh, consideration mattress thickness, but I didn't see anything about firmness, which would seem to be relevant here too. So, can you talk a little bit about how mattress softness or firmness could influence entrapment between the mattress and the bed rail? Sure thing. Um, so, when it comes to softness and firmness, uh, zone three testing. Uh, specifically tests for mattress compressibility and entrapment hazards associated with it. Um, the pass fail criterion um, is entirely based on how far the entrapment, um, the, the actual test probe is allowed to sink between the mattress and the bed rail. Uh, furthermore, the range of uh, uh, mattress firmness available on the market should be considered um, by, you know, any manufacturer that's designing APPRs. Um, Staff also notes that a final rule would require firms to certify compliance based on a reasonable testing program, which staff would define as testing throughout that entire range of mattress firmness, firmnesses um, to be a reasonable um, test program. And um, we would expect uh, certified products to meet those requirements through that throughout that range. Um, and then, in addition to that, staff further notes that CPSC testing um, in support of compliance would use um, reasonable but stressing conditions um, uh, of a compressible mattress. Um, but in addition to that, uh, even more, um, staff encourages uh, the submission of any comments, concerns, or additional information concerning mattress compressibility um, during the comment period for the NPR. Um, in particular, um, information on whether there should be a standard mattress, including firmness, um, and what um, that standard would look like um, would be valuable for us to consider. Well, that, that that's encouraging. I'm glad to hear that that you have thought through this issue and would consider requiring them to you know, a reasonable program that would have to test through the entire range of firmness and softness. Um, but it would probably be useful to spell that out for uh, for the firms who are actually doing the testing. And I guess when we get to the final rule, we could we could probably do that based on what we hear back here. So would would you recommend adding instructions at some point um, during the performance test to account for worst case scenario mattress firmness? Um, so staff is open to suggestions and comments um, um, during the NPR comment period, but um, in terms of staff's proposed language, um, note two um, states that testers and manufacturers should account. Um, for the ma all mattress types um, in order to account for foreseeable use and misuse of the products. Um, and again, uh, if this proposed rule were to um, be finalized, staff would be testing all these products um, in these mo more onerous applicable cases. Um, so it'd be to their detriment not to consider them or test to them. 
All right. Well, that's good to hear. I will read note two and make sure uh, I, I understand that. But I think maybe moving that up to more prominent, just just so we're perfectly clear what what testing we're putting on folks uh, could be useful. Now, there's a, a 30 day effective date in the proposal, and I very much appreciate that. I think that should be the default in all of our rules. Uh, so the shorter an effective date, the more we can increase the benefit of the rule for consumers. Is that right? Yeah, so if we were to extend that um, date, um, that means there's more time for these incidents to be happening. Um, that's the plain and simple. Of it. Well, uh, yeah, and I agree that that is unacceptable I, I, and because shorter effective dates maximize benefits, uh, we should be adopting those wherever we can. I mean, would you agree with that statement? I think, uh, I think we can, we can only talk for this rule. So we are recommending it for this rule. Our data shows that 92% of deaths are related to entrapment as opposed to other causes. And the package mentioned several times what the benefits would be if the rule prevents 92% of deaths. So I think what we're saying, and I wanted to make sure about this, does that mean that the analysis assumes that the rule would prevent 100% of entrapment deaths? So the um, assessment that staff uh, made so it was based on the modifications to the standard and um and it did while it did focus on entrapment deaths um we we did our sensitivity analysis to estimate the benefits for a range of 25 to 75 percent effectiveness which is 25 to 75 percent um prevented of the 92 percent of failure um uh, entrapments um so yeah. yeah that's 65 million it's it's only on the 92 percent um, but then, in addition to that, um, it doesn't account for any of the other residual benefits. Um, and so there's an extra 8% of falls and other um, types of hazards um, that would probably benefit from these, uh, these uh, having a, a mandatory standard. So I get that, and I appreciate the fact that even at a 20% effectiveness rate, we we blow the cost benefit out of the water on the positive end, which is good to see. Uh, but how effective do we think this will be at preventing these entrapment deaths is what I'm getting at. Do we do we think that it is going to be 100 percent effective at that 92 percent? Um, so we don't have exact numbers on how um, effective it's going to be. But what I can say is that staff has assessed the standard um, and, and technically speaking. And um, from that, we've concluded that it would likely address all of the known hazard modes. So those four entrapment zones, um, they're likely to be covered by the requirements that we are proposing here, um, technically speaking, because those are based on the anthropometric uh, measurements of those that are at risk um, for these types of hazards. Okay, so I'm still not trying to, I mean, we, we don't have an exact assessment of whether it will be 100, I mean, we, we don't have a projection of how, how good we think it'll be at, a, at a preventing those those deaths. Yeah, unfortunately, we don't have that uh, sort of magic ball, but we, we do know that even if it's only 25% effective, um, we're still, as you said, blowing it out of the water. Um, so that's really the best that we can really do. Okay. On the cost benefits, I guess I'll have to put that aside for another day. Um, in terms of and I, and um, and the chair asked about this a bit. So the petitioners here asked us to consider a ban on these products, and we the commission voted unanimously to grant that petition. There's not a lot of discussion about why the ban wasn't recommended in here. Um, can you explain how the costs and benefits of a ban would compare to the benefits and costs of this proposal? For, for example, would a ban be more likely to address entrapment deaths and injuries than the recommended performance standards? Yeah, um, so if APBRs are manned from the market, this will effectively eliminate APBR related deaths. Um, however, the cost of the lost utility um, from abandoned products. Um, so, you know, consumers losing the um, products that they use daily to get in and out of bed. Um, while that's unknown and unquantified by staff, um, that could ultimately outweigh the benefit and. That's because when they depend on these sorts of things, um, you know, they'd be willing to pay more 
um, for bed rail, and that that exact value isn't exactly um, quantifiable um, right now, at least. Um, and yeah, a ban by definition would remove all of these products um, that they depend on. Um, and um, and in addition to that, some uh, consumers would incur um, you know additional losses because they might be falling or um, getting injured because they don't have these products. So, what did we do to assess the utility of the products? Um, so, we we know that vulnerable um, persons often rely on these products um, to reduce their risk from falling, um, assist repositioning, and assist them in transitioning. Um, and the fact that 180,000 of these APBRs are sold um, annually, that indicates that um, these these products are they they do have utility for um, consumers, um, and that without these products, um, the alternatives would be um, extended hospital stays, purchasing or renting uh, medical beds, um, which um, if they um, if they were banned, um, staff would consider that a lot of low um, income individuals or people that don't have access would um, forego that expense and possibly expose themselves to the potential falling and um, other societal costs and injuries and deaths. Um, so, so, you know, I think there's just one thing I disagree with on that is that sales, in my opinion, are not indicative of utility. There are plenty of useless products sold. Uh, for example, at one point there were a lot of magnet sets that, that were being sold in, in, until recently. So uh, the question I think that I have on utility is, do we know that they do a good job of stopping people from rolling out of bed, uh, or for, or do they do a good job of helping people in and out of bed? And and I think those are the questions we should look at as we consider the package. And I'd love to get consumer comments on that to say, hey, yeah, these these really are useful. We use these every day. I'm. You know, there there might be a great argument for it, but I'd really like to take a look at that uh, before we just assume utility based on sales volume. Yes, definitely. Sure. That is something that um, staff um, wants to see comments on. Excellent. All right, thank you. Thank you, Commissioner. Um, Commissioner Boyle. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you, Mr. Dayal and Ms. Kim and all the staff who worked on this package. I really appreciate all the hard work. Uh, I have a, I do have a couple of questions uh, for you, Mr. Dial. I just wanted to ask a little bit about staff's assessment of the adequacy of the voluntary standard. Um, I know that we're proposing modifications. So does that mean by definition staff assesses the voluntary standard to be inadequate? Yeah, so um, we characterize the modifications as important clarifications. Um, staffs assesses ASTM F3186-17 to generally address the hazard patterns, but it leaves some testing ambiguity. Uh, based on the discussions with test labs and others, um, staff has identified some areas of the standard um, that need clarification, um, as well as um, some gaps that staff has identified in the standards requirements and methodology. Um, this makes it um, this makes it possible for um, testers to misinterpret the tests in a way that passes the standard, but does not address known um, product hazards. Um, staff propose these modifications to address these issues and provide test labs and manufacturers a consistent <laughs> way of ensuring that products um, which do not adequately address these hazards um, do not pass these tests. Okay, so uh, um, are you saying, I just want to clarify then uh, that those the changes are um, substantive? I'm not sure I, I understood your answer, uh, whether the modifications that we're proposing are substantive or editorial clarifying. Uh, they, they are substantive changes. Uh, so to the extent that you're asking if the voluntary standard is inadequate, as currently written, the answer is yes, it is inadequate without the additional modifications made by staff. Yes, thank you. That was what I was asking. Um, so I uh, wanted to just clarify that. Thank you, Ms. Kim. Um, 
But I would I would point out even if tomorrow they if all of the modifications were adopted in the voluntary standard, uh, that would not uh, mean that we should stop mandatory rulemaking, correct? Because of the zero um, uh, compliance that you found. Correct. Okay. Uh, can you uh, speculate as to why there was such striking, uh, abysmal uh, uh, compliance? Um, um, so, um, it's correct that, um, F 3186, um, so F 3186-17 was published in 2017 and it's been over five, um, five years since then. Um, frankly speaking, um, staff does not know why the market is not complying. Um, as stated in the briefing, um, staff has attempted to work. Um, with industry through every available venue available to us. Um, so at this point, staff strongly believe a standard is needed to prevent unnecessary deaths. Okay, thank you. Uh, I do have one other question about the uh, percent of um, victims based on gender. And I believe the package said that 70% of the incident victims and incident fatalities were female. Um, do you have any, how, how do you account for that differential? Yeah, so um, staff agrees that there is a clear gender disparity in incidents related to APPRs, um, but we don't have any specific data on um, um, to explain this. Um, while we know that older women outnumber older men, um, the difference in fatal fatal fatalities um, seems to be stronger than the difference in popu population. So could it be testing differences, physical differences, perhaps? Um, as of right now, staff doesn't have any insights on that, um, but it's something that we could definitely get back to you on. Yeah, I, I think it was a striking um, statistic and uh, might influence the type of testing that is done or the type of instrumentation, uh, perhaps. Okay, uh, I don't have any other questions. Again, thank you very much. I do uh, really strongly support action on this and uh, I appreciate all the staff work. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner. Uh, that finishes the round of questions. Does any commissioner have an additional question? Hearing none, again, I'd like to thank the staff for this informal briefing and to the commissioners for active participation. Um, I look forward to the consideration of this package soon. Um, as I end note, I also would say that our thoughts go out to the people of Puerto Rico and Florida as they're facing the storm. Uh, and uh, the wake of the storm as well. CPSC is putting out a lot of safety information about including the use of safe generators and urge people to use that information to protect themselves against uh, further harms. So with that, um, uh, the meeting is closed. Thanks.